Nevada, the Silver State. With an entry into the Union in 1864, Nevada's modern-day icon, Las Vegas, did not yet exist. Instead, the heart of the new 36th state was 400 miles to the north near Lake Tahoe. The state capital, Carson City. The small settlement along the Truckee River that would later become Reno. And perhaps most significantly of all, the mining town of Virginia City, site of the fabulous Comstock Lode. As Nevada became a state in 1864, the nation's focus was far to the east on the Civil War battlefields. In support of the war, residents of Virginia City continued their hard work extracting mineral wealth from what would become one of the richest gold and silver discoveries ever made. More than one American generation gained some familiarity with Virginia City from the popular TV series Bonanza and the famous Ponderosa Ranch. But when the Cartwrights came to town, it was Virginia City that was depicted during the late 1800s Today, the town of 1,500 residents is an historic landmark that is enjoyed by over a million visitors each year who come to see an authentic piece of Wild West history. But one weekend each year for the past four decades, this small historic town opens its arms to welcome a new breed of frontiersmen and women who come to compete in the Virginia City Grand Prix. run in 1971, the Grand Prix has pitted racers and machines in a brutal contest against the rugged terrain of northern Nevada. Today it represents a nostalgic off-road motorcycle race from days gone by. With over 850 racers set to compete this year, the VC Grand Prix is one of the largest, longest running, and most challenging races of its kind in North America. It's a different atmosphere when you come to Virginia City. And um, just to have all the spectators out there, everyone always has a positive attitude towards you. I mean, you could be dog tired on the backside and, and you just see some lonely kid out there hollering at the top of his lungs and having a great time. Um, to me, that's what Virginia City is. It, is it's, a, uh, it's a family event. It was about the race at first. Now it's about all the people, all the friends we made over the years. Seeing them, you, you don't see them all the time. The Virginia City Grand Prix is a happening. It's a motorcycle race, it's a test of man and machine. If you can finish the Virginia City Grand Prix, you are a hero. No matter what place you come in, you're a hero. There's just so many variables in this race that most races you can go to them and say, oh, it's only whoops, or this race is only trees. But this has rocks, trees, water, hills, up, down, it has everything. The event's getting close to 40 years of age, and it's amazing how much this event means to people. It's a real accomplishment to finish it, because it's just tough. It's, it's just demanding. And to go four and a half hours at full bore in that type of terrain is It's always brought me back every year for one main reason, is if I can finish this race every year, then I can finish any race anywhere. The springtime weather of northern Nevada is unpredictable at best, and the conditions at Virginia City's 6,000-foot elevation can vary greatly. Each year, racers must simply wait and see what Mother Nature has in store for them. It's in the type of the months where you never can tell if it's going to be dry and dusty, or if it's going to be wet and cool, or it's going to be snow. We've ridden in horrible rainstorms, and we've ridden when it's been 90 degrees. I mean, I've come in where my, my wheel won't even turn, it's so gummed up to that gummy clay. You'd be raining one minute, sunshine the next, and you'd know if you're gonna pull your garbage bag off your chest protector or, or take your next jersey off. When VC gets wet, it is like just the slipperiest dirt you've ever seen, and then it, it has different stages throughout the day as it dries out. There was one little short uphill that was just slime. And at the bottom, here's all these guys cheering you on. You couldn't figure out what they're doing until you hit the hill and then you pretty much knew what they were doing. They, were, they burned up clutches, 
broken chains, tired, mad, but they were there cheering you on and they were having fun. With a format that has varied little over the past four decades, this year's event has both Saturday and Sunday races with pro, expert, and amateur class racing on the first day, and the novice, women, vintage, and bomber classes the second day. Well, Saturday has definitely turned out to be the big day with the pro purse. Sunday is an intense day, but not nearly as intense. And it seems to be a lot more of the fun factor on Sunday because the money element gets taken out. On both race days, the motorcycles stage in rows of 10 for the start on Virginia City's fabled C Street, lined by old wooden sidewalks and authentic Western saloons and shops. Our start ceremony is something that everybody should see. When there are 400 motorcycles lined up 10 wide, on Main Street in Virginia City, Nevada. You're in town on Main Street. You've got streets lined with spectators. I mean, you feel like a superstar. It's so home feeling. It's just everybody's everybody's like excited to that when the first green flag goes, and then every 15 seconds it was just zooming out. As the riders prepare for the start of the 2009 race, the anticipation builds to another great event. I'm sure we're going to see a little bit of rock. I think we're going to see a little bit of six mile, and ultimately just have a great time. Just go out and survive the first lap and then charge after that. I think it's about attrition, you know, just being smooth and smart and don't stick it in a canyon and get stuck somewhere, you know? Typical VC, lots of rocks, fast roads, should be fun. With the ground being wet, it should be good, but it'll probably get dusty eventually. It's Nevada, so. Some spots you gotta watch out. I mean, as far as slippery, dirt up here, dry. You're not, you know, you gotta be breaking early. I know it's rocky, I know it's gonna be blue grooved, and hopefully the rain will put it down a little bit for dust. At the top of this year's field is a mix of old and new. Past champions understandably get a great deal of attention as top contenders for the 2009 win. There's a lot of fast guys up here. I'm sure Shane Esposito is really going to ride well. I understand Ty Davis is riding today. Irving Powers is starting on our row, so he's been flying. Last year's overall winner, Russ Neely, will be up there. Uh, Underwood, Espo's always fast. Definitely Ross Neely, Ty's here. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's there's a lot of young kids. I don't even know who they are that are riding. We got uh, Nick Fain, who's a local. Irving Powers is local. Um, Ross Neely, super fast. Got Shane Esposito. Nick Fain, Reese Honane, Ross Neely, I think those uh, Robert Underwood, Corey Vinoy. One of the favorites is the 2008 champion, Ross Neely, who won last year's event at the age of 16. I think it's good chances on the fourth row. I uh, think I can get out a good start, uh, keep my pace, I think I got it. The 2007 winner, Reese Hone, is a local racer who grew up in Virginia City and really knows how to ride the rugged VC terrain. And Shane Esposito, winner of three consecutive races starting in 2000, is one of the toughest competitors this race has ever seen. One unexpected late entry is from Southern California's Ty Davis. Ty is the second all-time winningest competitor of VC, with four overall championships starting with his first win in 1994. This field also includes many fast pro racers who have yet to win VC. Among the racers are Honda team rider Quinn Cody from Southern California and two local VC racers, Irving Powers, who was in striking distance of the leader in 2008, and Nick Fain, the 2008 second place finisher. This is my favorite race. It's, look, everybody's here. This is a big event. Uh, you know, gonna have almost a thousand riders. It's, it is the place to be. Several other dominant riders are also expected to be in contention this year, including Corey Vinoy, the 2008 champion of Northern Nevada's Desert Racing Series, and Robert Underwood, the number two finisher in that series. Other top Virginia City racers include Sam Key, Sean Berryman, Josh Wilson, and professional motocross racer Nate Tyranny. This year's race also includes the unknown quantity of some first-time VC competitors, such as Hollywood actor stuntman Jimmy Roberts, the son of legendary desert racer J.N. Roberts. Accompanying Jimmy from Southern Cal is 19-year-old fellow actor stuntman Logan Holliday, a face and name completely unfamiliar to Grand Prix fans. These racers are among the field of nearly 450 competitors registered to compete in the Grand Prix's grueling four-plus-hour event on Saturday, which features the pro and expert class riders. Setting the pace are the Blue Plate Pro Class Racers competing for a share of the nearly $10,000 cash prize. 
More than the money, though, the Grand Prix attracts top riders for the challenge. It is grueling. It's sort of, I don't want to say survival, but you have to be on your toes the whole time to do it. In this race, let me tell you something. If you slow up, you'll go faster. As the start time approaches, the roar of high-strung race engines fills the downtown corridor, reverberating off of the 150-year-old buildings. Thousands of fans crowd the streets to watch the excitement as the racers launch from the town's main street and race past historic buildings from the Wild West era of Virginia City. The course moves on and off of paved roads as the racers head down the hill on their way out of town. through the Virginia City High School campus and then on to the rugged desert trails. The interval start line spread the racers out over a 10 minute launch window, making it difficult to track the leader sequence until the lap timing information starts to come in. To add to the difficulty, Top riders starting near the back will need to pass more slower riders in the first lap. Uh, I'm on row 35, so it's a little ways back there. I don't know, I like passing. I don't know, it's a chore, it's fun. The names and faces change over the years, but the backdrop of this historic mining town and the rugged mountain terrain that surrounds it has remained a constant over the four decades of racing on the Comstock. Then nothing ever changes or moves in that area. So the more you race it, the better chance you have to get good. This course has a lot of challenges. They good uphills, a lot of off cameras. Anything can happen. It's, you know, you can be leading one lap and just one mistake, someone else will be leading. So we're not gonna know till the end of the day. The racer's view of the 21 mile course begins from the C Street staging area and start line then takes an immediate left turn and heads downhill through town. A short loop around the high school campus and racers begin to wind their way around the mountains just south of Virginia City. The course follows two track roads through areas of small pinyon pine trees and takes racers past many tailing piles and old decaying wooden structures from the Comstock's mining era. The racers cross a small plateau area before heading up the Purple Hill and traveling along an off camber that leads to a familiar looking saddle upon the ridge. The course becomes narrower and starts to turn rocky as riders enter a series of sharp switchbacks that head down the steep hill. Soon the course enters the top of the tight, rocky gulch known as Sutro Canyon. While not a particularly long stretch of the course, it is certainly one of the most challenging and riders are undoubtedly relieved to emerge from the bottom of the canyon. A sharp left-hand turn puts the racers on a two-track pole line that provides some level of rest after battling the Rocky Canyon. This series of trails passes through relatively bare hills and valleys with very few trees. The course leaves the pole line and travels along a ridge top before quickly descending to the paved road along Six Mile Canyon. Racers quickly pick up the pace as they climb the steady grade with motors often tapped out at speeds reaching 80 or 90 miles per hour in the straight sections. It lasts less than a minute before the course returns to dirt and rejoins the pole line that riders traveled along a few miles earlier. This two-track section is a patrol road for the overhead power line, and while it still has its share of rocks and rough terrain, it is one of the fastest dirt sections on this year's course. As the racers reach the far northeast corner of the course, they take a left turn and begin heading west back toward Virginia City.
This section of the course winds up and down through some rugged terrain before crossing about a mile of relatively open area, then descending sharply to rejoin Six Mile Canyon and start the second stretch of paved uphill racing. The racers pass Sugarloaf Mountain on their right side as they travel the asphalt surface that winds through this twisting canyon and then returns to dirt as they reach the cutoff to Seven Mile Canyon. The course quickly climbs a steep mountainside through a series of tight switchbacks to reach the top of the ridge. As racers pass more mining sites in the Silver Terrace Cemetery, they begin to see the buildings of Virginia City as they approach town. After winding through just a few streets, they return to the main timing checkpoint and the race's pit area. After completing their first lap and getting a look at the 23-mile course, the top 10 rider list takes shape as the racers pass through the main timing chute, getting their helmet barcode scanned and starting the flow of computerized timing information. It becomes apparent that the dark horse factors in play as the first time Grand Prix racer Logan Holiday on the number six Yamaha is in first place with his 38 minute lap time. This puts him one minute in the lead over Willie Heiss, riding number 11. Charging hard in third, Irving Powers on the number 12 Yamaha is within one and a half minutes of the leader. Defending champion Ross Neely is running in fourth. Hollywood's Jimmy Roberts on the number five Honda is in fifth and the three-time champion Shane Esposito on the number 72 Kawasaki is running in sixth. The top 10 is rounded out with the number 22 of Josh Fitzpatrick in seventh, number 14 Nick Fain in eighth, number 45 Sam Key in ninth, and number 33 Corey Vinoy running in 10th place. Carrying enough fuel for two laps, most riders do not pit after lap one and turn immediately back out onto the course after passing through timing, barely letting their engines idle for a moment after running them hard for about 40 minutes over the first lap. In what is expected to be a six lap race for the fastest riders, the strategy will be to pit after every other lap for fuel and drink, providing they experience no mechanical or other problems. The initial years of the Virginia City Grand Prix saw respectable rider counts of two or three hundred participants. You know, the race was started initially by a fellow named Joe Hathaway. It was his original idea to uh, do the Grand Prix. Word rapidly spread about the event's challenging course and unique setting, quickly creating interest within the race community. Within just a few years, the event's participation increased to seven or eight hundred riders over each weekend. Bob Del Carlo Sr., who was a sheriff, he had a son named Robert Jr. He was so instrumental in, in getting help for us. That's what made the politics and, and the, the race possible was Bob Jr. and Bob Sr. So once we lost the political ties, it was time for us to let it go, which was very sad, I mean, because that was the club's identity. In 2000, the, the race wasn't there, and the town kind of came to me, you know, being a local, and. Um, they knew, you know, I'd raced it a lot and was pretty involved with it. And so the town, they kind of said, hey, what can we do to get this going? Nick Fain, I believe, was the driving force in 02 to get that one back going again. He was young, he was energetic. Next thing you know, 02 rolls around and here we are. We are putting on the Grand Prix. He became a big driving factor in the, in the new club in Virginia City MC or VCMC that that eventually took it over. But nobody knew who they were. So the first couple of years, people people are cautious. If you're spending the kind of money that you have to spend to go race a motorcycle. Our first year we had, I think, 400 and something riders total. Then they found out that VCMC could, in fact, do the job. The next year went up to 700 and then 800 and then I think at one point it was over 1,000 and now it's kind of running about that, which is for a single race, that's one of the bigger ones out there and it's it's definitely a destination for uh, racers to come. 
After leaving the city streets behind, the early part of the course travels on two track roads that circle the Virginia City Mountains, providing some great vistas of the city in the distance. With blind corners and the start of rough rocky terrain, however, the racers have little time to enjoy the views. As they wind their way up the mountain, the racers find themselves alternately at high speed and hitting the brakes as they climb their way up Purple Hill. With a feel for the course from the first time around, racers charge off hard to attack their second lap around the 23-mile course. As the trails start to get pounded by over 400 riders, the dust picks up and lines between the rocks begin to form on the course. Showing their impressive speed through the demanding terrain, the lead riders have already begun to catch and pass lapped riders by the end of the second lap. The computerized scoring system flashes the time and position of each rider as they once again pass through the main timing sheet. The lap two standings show Logan Holiday still in the lead. Irving Powers moving up to second. Defending champion Ross Neely in third. Robert Underwood riding the number 219 has jumped from 11th to 4th place, with Willie Heiss falling back to 5th. The top 10 is now rounded out with number 191 Quinn Cody jumping into 6th, Shane Esposito falling to 7th. The number 40 Ryan Toomey moving into 8th, Sam Key holding 9th, and Josh Fitzpatrick sliding back to 10th. At the conclusion of the second lap, most all top riders head to the pits for fuel and perhaps some refreshment. A stunning development unfolds at the conclusion of lap 2. After charging hard for nearly an hour and a half to keep Holiday in striking range, Irving Powers suffers a race-ending problem as the engine in his YZ250 blows right at the end of lap 2. He is devastated to be put out of the race and what he felt would finally be his year at Virginia City. Yeah, everything went perfect, riding well, and riding as good as I ever had in my life. In a race whose reputation is for extremely challenging terrain, it's amazing that one particular stretch of trail has become especially notorious and is legendary unto itself. In 1860, as Comstock mining was in full swing, German mining engineer Adolf Sutro envisioned an ambitious project that would build a tunnel starting four miles east of Virginia City and burrowing far below the Comstock mining district to provide more economical access for removing ore. Over the years, the tunnel was abandoned and it fell into complete disrepair. Today, the tunnel remains inaccessible, but perhaps the most surprising legacy is one that Adolf could never have conceived of the namesake canyon under which the tunnel runs for its first bond. Sucho Canyon is the rock garden of hell. It's a rock garden down, and it's, and it's a rock garden up. I'm looking forward to uh, Sutro Canyon. I hear they're running that this year. Okay, we're gonna be going down Sutro Canyon, which is a, a rock fest. Okay. Um, looking forward to uh, Sutro. It's always fun to go down that, maybe try to gain a little, get, gain some positions down there. Sutro, no, no. No. And everybody that runs this place knows I hate Sutro. So, but you gotta deal with it, right? It is what it is. While the fastest of riders move impressively through the rocks, even they must take great care to avoid race-ending damage to their bikes or their bodies. Passing slower riders could be a challenge on many parts of the course, but the rocky terrain and tight trails through Sutro make it extra challenging and hazardous. Using the racer's equivalent of a horn, faster riders alert those who they intend to pass with a loud rev of their engine. 
Of course, Sutro Canyon is, is legendary. And every time they say they're gonna run Sutro Canyon, it's, it's an adventure. It's rocks, it's rocks for as far as you can see. As always, there were plenty of spills in Sutro, but fortunately, only minor injuries this year. It's hard to imagine that a racer would not remember all about their experience running VC, but if they should somehow forget almost everything about it, they will forever remember beating their way through the infamous Sutro Canyon. Man, there's one section so rocky, it's like this creek bed, it's probably about half a mile long, it's tough. Oh, that, the gulch, the gully down at the bottom, a lot of stair steps. That box canyon they put us in was pretty gnarly. At the conclusion of lap three, Logan Holliday retains his grip on the lead, but problems continue to plague other top contenders. Disappointment strikes as three-time champion Shane Esposito limps into the main timing in 23rd place and is forced to call it a day as previously bruised ribs suffered from new encounters with Comstock Rocks. I went down once, that one wasn't bad, and then I actually went down in Sutro and I didn't say anything last night, but I've been riding injured, so I shouldn't have been really riding today, but you know, you gotta do it. With Holiday in the lead and Powers having dropped out at the end of lap two with a tortured motor, the lap three timing shows Quinn Cody to have moved up to second place and Robert Underwood to third. The most dramatic move comes from 2007 champ Reese Hone, who, after starting on row 36 and contending with a solid stream of slower riders from the start, moves from 19th after the first lap to fourth place by the end of lap three. Defending champion Ross Neely clocks in at only nine seconds behind in fifth place. There have been many great racers competing and winning at Virginia City over the years. The 2009 event saw some notable past champions visiting VC to watch the race, such as 1973 champion Charlie Parker and the very first Grand Prix champion from 1971, Mr. Leroy K. The time I uh, rode it, uh, uh, we had snow on the ground. There's snow up here on top and dust in the bottom down around Sutro where we went there. The Grand Prix even brings out the likes of world motocross champion Brad Lackey and perhaps the greatest motorcycle champion of all time, two-time Grand National Champion and Hall of Famer, Dick Mann. Unable to attend this year was the race's most successful competitor, seven-time champion Larry Rossler. And Larry Rossler and I have uh, one thing in common. I have a silver ingot. He has seven of them. Back in the day, this, they gave you this award, which is a, it's a six and a half pound silver bar. Well, it's always been fun coming up here. I, um, you know, I have won this before. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to make it every year, but whenever I can make it, it's always been a real good race, and um, it's always been real challenging. You know? He was a motocrosser before he was an off-road guy, and he, uh, we went to training camps in Sweden together in the 70s, and uh, he was just uh, a little bit different and that's why he's as good as he is. He's, you know, even to this day, he's still back. Uh, let me just say that all the champion circuit racers, dirt trackers, road racers, we're really glad Larry never wanted to do that. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, he could do it all. Yeah, he was the dude. Larry Rosser was, was a, probably to me, the best all-around rider ever made to date. The only one close to him would be, of course, Danny Hamill, who unfortunately was killed at a very young age. Virginia City was also won twice in the early 90s by a young racing phenomenon from Las Vegas by the name of Danny Hamill. For me, he was my biggest hero just because he was the big guy on a motorcycle and I rode a 500, he rode a 500, and, um, and he was the nicest guy. And he could see things at 100 miles an hour that we can't see at a standstill. After a win in 1993 and 1995, tragedy struck Danny Hamill, ending one of the most promising racing careers this sport has ever seen. Right, that's Danny Hamill, look at him cook, Woo! Fresh from his 95 win in VC, the 23-year-old was involved in a fatal high-speed collision with a car in the Baja 500. There's been nobody, in my opinion, that's really topped Danny's talents. 
God needed somebody to ride with is all I could say. And he was the man that got chosen because he was the best one ever made. As the course reaches the furthest point from the starting line, riders descend from the mountains and hit the paved surface of Six Mile Canyon. Six Mile Canyon, of course, that's always fun to get on a little pavement. The road, I, I don't really like you know, going fast on the road, so I think that's going to be my toughest thing right there. This mile-long segment is the first of two that are included in this year's course, providing for some very high-speed racing, although on a slightly unnerving surface for motorcycles whose tires and riders are more suited to the dirt. Race speeds were displayed on the radar sign lent to the club by the Story County Sheriff Department, with some bikes hitting more than 90 miles an hour. After a minute or less to cover the first mile-long pavement section, riders jump back to the dirt and are immediately greeted by a small but chewed up hill that quickly reminds them where they are racing. Riders churn through the loose dirt and cloud of dust as they head north for the pole line road. As the riders complete their fourth lap, timing shows the top two spots still held by Holiday and Cody. The third and fourth place position swapped with Hone jumping ahead of Underwood by about one minute. Unexpectedly, fifth place is turned over and is now held by Nate Tyranny, as defending champion Ross Neely has fallen to ninth place, dropping seven minutes further behind the lead pack. The urgent activity in Neely's pit quickly explains the problem. Ross has suffered tire problems from the punishing terrain and was forced to race almost his entire lap four with flaps front and rear. So not only does Neely lose time riding nearly an entire lap on dual flats, but the added pit time to replace both wheels slows him further. Yeah, bad luck. Never heard of get that, you just blow him out with a rock. With Virginia City, there are many stories that come out of each race, and as the race has grown, there are also a collection of colorful characters and long-standing traditions. Racers often have fun expressing themselves with riding style, fashion, or both. Everyone has their goal at the Grand Prix, to win, to improve over last year, or just to survive it. The race's vintage class pits near antique pre-1975 motorcycles against the brutal terrain that truly tests even the most advanced machine. For the fourth year in a row, Travis Kearns comes to Virginia City to compete in that vintage class, riding a Husqvarna 450 that is more than twice his age. And paying tribute to his idol, Steve McQueen, he wears retro gear like that sported by the King of Cool in the classic 1971 motorcycle movie on any Sunday. Well, you know, you see him on, on any Sunday. It's, you know, he's an actor, he's a movie star, desert racer, he's just the king of cool. So how is it to ride a 1972 Husky 450? Painful. I mean, I'm coming down, the bike's coming up. I got a gnarly headache. As you can see, there's no travel. I think it's four in the, four in the back, seven in the front. Uh, another one of the very colorful individuals that, that always would show up in the early years, John McCowan and his dog Cookie, who always sat on the gas tank. He put a piece of carpet right in the middle of the tank. And that dog would sit there and he would adjust himself right to left, front to back. And he was nice enough to sign autographs for us. John and his dog were always the highlight of the event. The Grand Prix attracts all sorts of riders and generations of families make this race their spring tradition. This includes one rider named Nevada Key who was featured on last year's race poster. Despite appearing on the 2008 poster, Nevada was unable to compete that year due to family obligations. After giving birth to her newest desert racer, Nevada is back in 2009 to compete on Sunday in her fifth Grand Prix since 2003. Her husband Sam races in the Saturday Pro Class, so pitting for each other and taking turns watching the kids makes racing a real family affair. And what happens when the kids of racing moms grow up? More racing, of course. Patty Henning and her daughter Jenna race side by side, competing for top honors in the women's division. Well, it's really fun because I grew up racing and my sisters did and you know, my, mom, my dad did and then my mom went there. Having raced the Grand Prix seven times, Patty is one of the winningest competitors here with five first place finishes in the women's class. And this year marks the third year that she has raced against her daughter, Jenna. I'm thinking that it pretty much sucks that my mom's two rows ahead of me. I gotta catch her. 
And while there is a women's class on Sunday where 26 racers compete, there was one adventurous woman, a 17-year-old, who decided to play with the boys on Saturday. Well, last time I rode it was really fun, but I don't know, it seems like it's going to be hard. Who says girls can't play in the dirt? Occasionally, the rare individual comes along who has the ability to shape and influence many around them. Sometimes it comes behind a modest demeanor and calm, low-key nature that belies their considerable talent and accomplishments. We lost a checker. He's a local man, uh, George Walker. Yep. Really helped me. A long time ago. He definitely grew up in the in the checkers club, the notorious checkers club. They uh, they're kind of the outlaw gang, I guess, in the in the desert. They were a group of rowdy partiers, stay up all night drinking. The next day, they'd be, you know, the top five guys would be in checkers uniforms. Walker was a pioneering motorcycle racer from Southern California who moved to Virginia City in the late 80s. He touched the lives of many during his 75-year life and the three decades he spent living in Virginia City. He was a, kind of a personality more than just a racer. I mean, everybody kind of looked up to George. He had bright white hair and um, just the calmest personality and he made everybody feel like a friend. One of the most enduring and recognizable characters involved with the Grand Prix is not known for being a competitor. Rather, he has been the voice of the race for as long as many can remember. He is Bob Kavakis, better known as Moto Mouth. I first became involved with the uh, the Virginia City Grand Prix. I was a member of Western States Racing Association in 1974-75 and went up to Virginia City to help with the Grand Prix. He's a little crazy. I think he was banned a year or two here and there for having a little too much fun. I decided to see if there were any ladies who wanted to get their picture taken for free with Moto if they took their shirts off. So we had a little contest up there and they fired me. I remember coming up here as a kid just watching Moto mouth getting drunk. <laughs> and asking to see some ladies show their boobs, stuff like that. You know? But then they got enough people wanted me back. They hired me back the next year, but gave me a contract and made me I have to tone it down a little bit. It was Virginia City, it was it was a free-for-all. Once the edges were found, then we had to back it down because you couldn't go over the edge. At the far corner of the race course to the northeast of Virginia City, riders make their way along a two-track road that follows an overhead power line. The course then pulls off to the pole line to turn west and head for a remote time check number two. While still chopped up in some areas, the high-speed road section provides racers with a bit of a rest from the tight, super rocky stretches found in many other sections of the course. Riders must take care, however, because complacency can still result in a crash, now just at higher speeds. Need a hand? Oh, fuck. The conclusion of lap five saw only minor jockeying within the front pack of racers, with Logan Holliday still holding on to the lead and Quinn Cody remaining in second place, logging faster lap times than Holliday ever since lap three. Robert Underwood and Reese Honey continue to battle, with Underwood regaining third place and Hone falling back to fourth. Good, Nate man. Tyranny remains in fifth. And rounding out the top 10, we had Sam Key in sixth, Corey Vinoy holding seventh, Ross Neely pulling back up to eighth, Steve Garnett in ninth, and Sean Berryman in 10th. Whether battling for the top 10 leaderboard or just struggling to make it around in one piece, the Grand Prix holds a very special place in the hearts of those who have done battle with this rugged train over the years. We have so many people that are passionate about the sport and they become passionate about the event. BC is one of the most incredible things I've ever done with my life. This is my 25th year of doing this. Um, I haven't rode BC since I was 19. Yeah, 31 years ago. Yeah, over 30 years ago. I, I actually, it was on my bucket list. I actually had a heart attack a year ago and started training, lost 40 pounds, wanted to get back into riding and pushed hard, and this was one of my goals. The devotion and dedicated following this event creates is truly impressive and demonstrated by many who return year after year. It's an event that any, any uh, person who considers themselves an off-road racer Hat just has to ride. We're from Denver, Colorado. Yeah, I can drove 
16 hours each way and uh, turn around and do it tomorrow and head back and be to work on Monday. The same is true for those who first decide they simply have to experience for themselves this amazing race they keep hearing about. I uh, was in the shop this year and the people coming in that have never raced an off-road motorcycle race before ever and they come in and they buy hundreds of dollars of stuff and said, I'm racing VCGP. And I'm like, is that the smartest idea? I mean, you never raced before and you're gonna go race one of the hardest races there is. It doesn't matter, I'm racing it. It's just the name that's, that's come along through the years. This is the elite race in our area for desert racers. There's a lot of people here that race one time a year and they come to our event. We get sea riders, people who've never raced a race before, but they've heard of Virginia City a lot of those riders, interestingly enough, are people who have families. They're in their 30s and their 40s, and they want they want to go prove to themselves that they can do what's there at Virginia City. We get a lot of people from Washington, um, Utah, New Mexico, Texas. You get people that drive, you know, halfway across the country. As a motorcycle group, the 100-year-old Tacoma Motorcycle Club has made the Grand Prix one of their must-do annual events. Saturday's Row 13 and Sunday's Row 9 were dominated by the TMC riders as they kept their club's 38 Grand Prix tradition alive. But when you ask anyone familiar with this event about the racers who exemplify dedication, one name stands above them all. Artichoke Joe, I mean, uh, he's a legend, man. A farmer from Northern California, Joe DeVecchio, has competed in every race since the event began in 1971. It was about 15 or 20 of us years ago that, that first came up here, and um, we just uh, all really just kind of withered away in the years. You guys passed away, and a lot of good old friends of mine used to come and pass away. And I thought back that I, I kind of do this race for them still. I think it is. He's just a guy who loves riding a motorcycle, and he does pretty well. He's pretty fast, been riding a bike I think for 50 years. And as if a 38-year streak was not impressive enough. This year, Artichoke Joe will compete both on Saturday in the over 50 expert class and on Sunday in the bomber class for the less than modern motorcycles. When I make this race every year, the rest of the year is a cakewalk. After the course makes its way through the mountains for a few miles, riders descend a steep downhill section that tempts them into some high speed yet requires them to keep tight control so they can set up to brake hard and make a sharp right-hand turn. The two-track then winds along a washed-out creek and leads riders down to the second section of Six Mile Canyon for another mile of pavement racing. The backside of the course is where a few top riders have blazed their own trail in order to pass slower riders, or just pick up a few extra seconds. The intent is for the riders to stay within 15 feet of the marked trail to ensure all riders are navigating the same course. At times, riders take more liberties and may try to gain ground by deviating further off the marked course. A risk is always run since being observed by a sweeper or course worker can result in a time penalty for the violation. After completing the second stretch of pavement racing, the course turns back to the dirt by heading through the cottonwood trees in Seven Mile Canyon. Riders start winding their way through the forested hills along more single track and two track sections. As the course passes the historic Silver Terrace Cemetery, riders begin to see the buildings on the outskirts of Virginia City. They soon wind through the city streets once again to head into the main time checkpoint and the race pit area. As the four hour mark is finally reached and the checkered flag appears, nearly one third of the starting field is no longer running. For those still on the course, their next pit arrival will mark the end of their race. For the fastest among them, though, the race extends to six laps, with 36 racers able to make it a 138-mile day. As the top finisher's times roll in and the unofficial results begin to form, it appears Logan Holliday has managed to retain the top position that he impressively held for the entire race. Well, I knew I was running really hard, and I, I couldn't imagine even you be able to be going any faster because I couldn't imagine going any faster than what I was doing. It. I was hitting rocks so hard, going so fast, wide open through everything. And uh, I figured it out about lap four that I was in the lead. 
And it just made, it just gave me some motivation to, to keep on going and go for the win. Four minutes behind Holiday is second place finisher Quinn Cody. Yeah, it was a good time, you know. I just first lap I had to be super careful not to not to do anything stupid because you know I was on the 20th row and there's a lot of guys just freight train in front of me. And, uh, you get off the main line, it's really rocky out there and uh, you can crash pretty easy. Robert Underwood's time has him finishing three minutes back in third place. I mean there's so many rides out there and all of them are just out of control, so it was super hard. The fourth position appears to be held by Nate Tyranny. The 2007 champion, Reese Hone, rolls up in the fifth spot, showing some tremendous wear and tear from the race. After struggling with two flat tires on lap four, defending champion Ross Neely completes his race with yet another flat tire suffered during his sixth lap. Despite the impact, he still manages to end the day with an apparent sixth place finish. Rounding out the top 10 finishers are Corey Vinoy in seventh, Sam Key in eighth, Stephen Garnett in ninth, and Sean Berryman in tenth. Looked like everybody was just laid out on the track everywhere. There was bikes everywhere. I couldn't get in a groove because every time I get going fast, people would be falling over in front of me and I had to blow off the course. I went down actually first lap, jammed my knee into the ground really hard. <laughs> I thought I uh, hurt myself, but I kept on going. And... About the fifth lap, I had a dial. It was, uh, that was probably my fastest lap. Probably, probably third lap, I kind of had the course figured out and, you know, was able to, to find my way and it started getting worked in really well. You know, there was good lines starting to form. I think, I think I got faster on the last lap. Every lap was faster and faster and faster. The exhaustion of the competitors is very apparent as they, one by one, make their way off the course, receive their finisher's pin, and are happily greeted by friends and fans. As Moto gathers the top finishers up on his announcing platform for interviews, it takes more than an hour after the checkered flag is out for the remaining racers to clear the course and finally wrap up their race day. By early evening, hundreds have gathered at the Delta Saloon to continue the celebration, compare their wounds, and swap war stories about their day doing battle with the rugged hills of the Comstock. Soon, everyone heads upstairs to hear of the final results and the competitors receive their awards. Prior to announcing race results, Moto mentioned some penalty adjustments and made a strong point of admonishing the racers for some course cutting. I will tell you that the results they handed me dropped three pros out of the top ten for short course. Virginia City local Matt Zulam wins the Open Expert class as well as the 10th overall honors. The remaining nine overall finishers are from the pro class, but the results do not come without some surprise and controversy. In ninth overall, Cody Wallace. Uh, this year was tough. Uh, it was really dusty and uh, really hard to pass off the start. It was just a cloud of dust. In eighth place, Sean Berryman. It was really hard to pass in some areas, but it's a Virginia City we all know and love. In seventh overall, Sam Key from Rainbow. It's like once a year you decide to come racing. And I crashed twice in the seventh lap, but other than that, I had a lot of fun. Sixth overall, <laughs> great kid. He and Tumi, I know, had a little battle today. Corey Venora from Colville, California. Was Virginia City as great as you remember? I mean, you're young, but you've raced it a couple times. Um, it was smoother than I thought it'd be. Why? Uh, just all the rocks were knocked off. In fifth, the defending champ, Ross Neely. Was it good for the whole bunch of other fast guys out there? Well, there was a bunch, but, uh, you know, I thought it was one. And... I uh, pushed it maybe a little bit too hard, got a three flat, so that kind of put me down. And in fourth, local favorite, 2007 winner, Reese Hone.
they ran some new stuff I've never even ran, so I was quite shocked. And uh, had a really good time. Everything seemed to go well. So. Coming in third, professional motocrosser Nate Tyranny. Every year I get excited for this race, and then uh, I take off the first lap and I'm pissed off, wondering why I do this. So I think it's just kind of for me to prove to myself, and uh, this is my third year now. I got a fourth, a ninth, and a third, so I want to win this thing before I die. And in second place, local desert racer Robert Underwood. I liked it a lot, it was really good, just super dusty, super rocky. I started in the back, so it was super hard to pass, but I had, had lots of fun, had some good little battles going on, and just had a good time. And leading all day from Southern California, our 2009 champ, Logan Holiday. this race I really wanted to win it and I won it <laughs> it's really rocky but I like it it's fun I like the rocks they're technical undoubtedly the most bewildered and unhappy person in the room was Quinn Cody whose assumed second place finish was not part of the awards Steve Garnett, expecting a ninth place finish and some prize money, was also surprised to see his finish now listed as 18th in the pro class and 34th overall. With no explanation for this change in results, Cody sat down with Donnie Bird, president of VCMC. I had six numbers that were turned in. They were out there, and out of over 400 riders, I get six numbers turned in, and they say to me, Donnie, these six guys were caught taking a line that was off the mark trail. I know where I went off, and I mean, it was a burned in trail that there was a, there was a switchback that went like that. It was maybe 50 yards to the switchback, if that. But you got caught doing what everybody, a lot of other people were doing, and they didn't get caught, and it sucks, but at the end of the day, six numbers get turned in. It's my job to try to make it, to, to, to prevent that from happening. After debating the situation for nearly an hour, Cody resigns himself to the fact that his time penalty will stand for the short coursing that he and a few others were observed doing, but which he feels many others got away with. Basically, you know, I admitted to the guy that, you know, I went off the course, you know, maybe cut off 50 yards of the course to pass some lapper guys that were just, you know, freight training through the rocks. And it was a burned in trail that a bunch of guys had been taking and you know, there was a guy standing at the bottom. So when you're behind six guys and you can pass them by taking a line, we're all gonna take it. They happen to get, they did it, both of them did it the last lap. There was sweepers there that took their numbers. There was stuff that guys were doing that, the only way you know to do that is if you've ridden this course, because they were going down the mountain, guys that I had just passed, and all of a sudden I look back and they're coming down the mountain in front of me. The controversy over course cutting and time penalties added drama to the 2009 race, but didn't overshadow the stories of many others during the event or the success of this 38th running. First time competitor Jimmy Roberts captured the over 40 expert class, while 1973 champion Daryl Brown won first in the over 50 experts. And the Ironman Artichoke Joe completed his 38th race, placing fifth in the over 50 expert on Saturday and second in the bomber class on Sunday. Corey Vinoy, the sixth place pro finisher on Saturday, also competed on Sunday in the bomber class, winning his class and taking overall honors on Sunday. Um, my shock blew out the second lap, so I was just running on a spring the rest of the race. Other than that, the bike ran good. As for Patty Henning, she beat out daughter Jenna in the women's class, setting a women's record with six victories. The first time I raced was in 1979 here. I just turned 18, that's when my dad would first let me race. And winning with style, Travis Kearns placed first in the vintage class for his third year in a row. For the 38th running, the Virginia City Grand Prix represents one of the classic events in off-road motorcycle racing, and was a memorable experience for all. And the race is fun, but 
as soon as it's over, you think it's the worst thing. But it is a fun race. I hope to God this thing keeps going for many, many, many years. It was fun. I fell a lot. Not sure why, but I fell a lot. <laughs> One of the best courses I've seen in years. A lot of fun. It's just dust from the very start to the very end. It was fun and challenging, and um, as always, VC is just a, a, a great race. Oh, when I saw the suture today, I had a smile from the ear to ear. That suture came and beat me up, but hey, it's racing. And this year had to have been one of the funnest, fastest courses I've gotten to ride. It was incredible. It's a very long day. Anything can happen up here. I mean, it's, it's a true man's race here. It really is. It's the toughest thing I've ever done. There's nothing I don't think in my body that doesn't hurt right now. So, but uh, fun, still a lot of fun. Do it again. Yeah. I hope I'm riding it when I'm 60. I kind of like the rocks. <laughs> I'm ready to come back next year. <laughs> it's the Virginia City Grand Prix. From the 15-year-old who made the minimum cutoff age by only one day, and the 17-year-old who is the only woman racer on Saturday, to the 15 mature racers competing on Sunday in the 60 and over class. From the rocket fast pro and expert racers, to the not so much. From the first time racers, to the 38 year Ironman. I'm not even tired, I'm having a great day. Over 850 racers participated in the 2009 event. They became part of the Grand Prix legacy and they experienced firsthand the dust on the Comstock. Uh, I already said no, but I'm sure I'll be here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'll be back, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, I'll probably be back. I mean, it, it, it's such a cool race with, with you know, so much culture and just history here, you know, yeah. It's kind of hard race to stay away from. So. It was the first time for me, and that was a blast. I'll be back next year for sure. Absolutely, we'll be we'll be back next year for sure. We'll be back next year. Hell yeah! Definitely. We'll be back next year for sure. Absolutely. Oh yeah, I'll be back. Oh, I can't wait for next year. I will be here for sure. I'll be back next year because you kicked my ass this year. I'll be bringing some more friends next year. Yeah, I'll be back next year. I'll be back next year and I'm gonna try to win it again. Awesome race. You know what? Today. The Mountain won. I lost. But you know what? There's next year. We'll be back next year. We'll be back next year. Yeah! Virginia City Rock. The greatest race in the country. For by far. By far. The 
greatest race, I think, the greatest race that goes on certainly in the western United States and anywhere else I've been involved. Just when you think you're, everything's going good, something goes bad and it goes bad fast just because it's unforgiving course because it's so rocky. If you say, I'm going to race Virginia City and you stop your story then, then people who aren't familiar with, familiar with what we do will think about just another motorcycle race like what you see on TV. And it's not. It's way more than that. It's way more than that. And it has been for many, many years. It's a race that you just want to run even if you don't finish it because you'll, you'll be back to finish it. When I uh, raced my first big bike race when I was 15, I uh, got DQ'd because I raced, uh, jumped on a different bike actually. And <laughs> so didn't turn out too well. Then I came back when I was 16 and won it, so it was good. Outstanding. Congratulations. I think 97 was the first year I tried it and crashed and came back again and crashed the next year. Finally learned that you need to slow down. Where else in America can you get on your motorcycle and ride up and down Main Street in a rider's parade? and wave, have the sheriff lead you back and forth through town. Uh, it's wonderful, it's, it's uh, nowhere else, it's Virginia City. This is a, this is a, this is a function, this is a, this is a happening. This, it, people that don't come and race this, this is a happening. Probably the first thing I want to say, I'm going to kick Daryl Brown's ass tomorrow. He, <laughs> he, he said he was coming up here, he called me a couple days ago told me what was going on, said, I better come up here. I said, okay, you going? Oh, yeah. He says uh, he was worried about drinking too much. But uh, I, uh, I don't see him. <laughs> hey, hey Daryl, the first thing you're going to do, this Leroy, if you didn't know it, I'm going to kick your ass tomorrow. You're supposed to be here. And I'm talking physically, not motorcycle-wise. <laughs> Rosser is kind of my hero when I was retired and older. It's because he was still doing what he was doing. He's still winning races really late in his life and in his career. Two girls on each shoulder at all times, the stars of the show, Larry was the man. I don't know what he did or how he did it, but he did it right. I wrote a year one year, we, we wrote a section in the back garden, it's called the Rock Garden. Imagine every knobby coming off your front wheel, all the bikes, everybody rode that year. It was, it was pretty wild. It was like almost a mile and a half ride. It was just brutal. In fact, I got the tire at the ranch stuck right on the wall with no knobs on it. It's, it's one of those events where you actually see riders stop and say, I don't want to go back out yet. I want to go back out because I want to finish Virginia City, but give me a few minutes to collect myself, to look and see how big the blisters are in the palm of my hands. It's Virginia City and it's, there's nothing like it. And the people that never get to come and experience Virginia City, they should take the time and the opportunity to come and do it because it is unique to itself. There's nothing like it anywhere. Well, the Virginia City Grand Prix, for my nickel, is probably one of the greatest off-road motorcycle races in the United States, maybe even in the world.